What's going on guys, it's Bromley at Empire Barbell. And today I wanna to talk about program structure. Specifically, I wanna talk about the actual progressions that you're gonna put into your programs so that when you have to sit down and pick your sets, reps, percentages, and figure out how those are gonna progress week to week, you're not left like Stephen King with writer's block. There are a lot of wildly different approaches to training and that variety can make choosing one seem like a daunting task. It should not be daunting, it should actually be very simple. Don't fall in the trap of thinking that all of the variety of options mean that there's somehow one magical system you have to find that's going to work perfectly for you. It's not like finding your soulmate, it's not like finding a spirit animal. The amount of variety that you see in top level lifters is actually a testament to the fact that so many different approaches do work and work well. It's just your job to find one, apply yourself to it and make it work for you. As Ed Cohen said in a recent Matt Wenning interview, doesn't matter what you do, just make it work. It's the wisest words I've ever heard. So we're gonna start out with a little overview of periodization and programming structure as a whole so that by the time we go over these actual progressions, we have fresh in our mind the pattern that we're supposed to fit it into. So I wanna make sure we're all on the same page. So here's a brief rundown of obnoxious training terminology that a bunch of academics came up with. I'm not a fan of people or institutions who overcomplicate really simple ideas. And some of this is an example of that. So I'm gonna kind of dumb it down for everybody because this isn't really hard stuff and it shouldn't be overcomplicated. So periodization, if most of you should know by now, that's just a fancy word for training structure. We run through our training structure in a periodized manner, meaning we come back to the same spot at regular in, uh, intervals. So you can think of the periodic table of the elements. We start with hydrogen with one proton as you add protons, you end up going down the rows and eventually you come back to the same column. Each column has similar chemical properties. So the further you progress down, you know, you still have the noble gases, you still have the alkali metals. Training is not that different. I don't know if that made things simpler for you. The training blocks you do three years from now, let's say you're running through a volume phase, it's gonna be similar to what you're doing now, it's just going to be progressed further down. So there's this idea of cycling back and forth between the same types of training. Now a big mistake that people make is thinking that periodization is like an option. It's something you can do or something that you should be doing. If you train, you're engaging in some type of periodization. I mean, if you're doing the same weight, sets, reps, exercises day in, day out, then you got me, you're not periodizing. But to everybody else, if you add five pounds on the bar, if you swap out movements, if you add sets, take away sets, you're periodizing. Your job is to engage in good periodization and that's why we're here right now. So we start out with the biggest aspect which is the macro cycle. Macro cycle, meso cycle, micro cycle, nobody talks like this. It's a dumb term, I don't like it, there's too many syllables and it complicates it. Macro cycles is a fancy word for your prep. Now there's different applications for macro cycle if you're an Olympic lifter and you have to keep in mind this four year training cycle to encompass all your world championships and then this big cycle at the end, it can get kind of complicated. You don't have to worry about that. For practical purposes, just think of macro cycle as you starting out without a training plan, not knowing what you're doing, to your fully realized contest performance at the meet. This is your prep. So macro cycle, prep, just think prep. The macro cycle is broken up into meso cycles. Those are just individual training blocks. Each block is going to encompass some specific trait or it's gonna have some feature or series of uh, features that make it kind of distinct from the other ones. And your job is to kind of organize those in a really intelligent, progressive manner so that you end up contest day in your final form. Each training block is made up of several micro cycles. Those are just training weeks. Micro cycles can vary, but 99% of people use seven days just out of sheer convenience. There's no real reason for you to change that. Now on the one hand, you might have something like starting strength where you're going A, B, A, B, and that's like a three or four day micro cycle. On the other end, you might have something like a lily bridge approach where you're going you know, heavy bench, heavy squat, and then week two is light bench, heavy deadlift. You could argue that's a 14 day training week. Don't beat yourself up trying to think about it. Seven days is the most common approach. It's just your series of workouts before you cycle back to the next series of similar workouts. So prep divided into blocks, 
divided into training weeks. That's the gist of it. Now, these blocks that you're looking at up here, you want to organize several of them in a row to lead you to this ultimate conclusion. So they get different definitions. Uh, this is probably the most confusing one you come across, accumulation, transmutation, or transition, depending on who you're reading, realization. These different terminologies, they might have some subtle contextual differences depending again on who you're reading. For your purposes, it does not matter. No matter what label you put on it, it's gonna contain the same basic features. So you just need kind of a broad idea, a broad conceptual idea of, of how they work. Um, the idea is you're kind of a, accumulating fatigue, I guess, you can think of it that way. There's more work, there's more volume. Because of that, you're gonna be gaining hypertrophy, you know, from the context of a strength athlete. More volume means more muscle growth. It's also gonna be more varied. You're broadly going to be training different movements. Uh, your split might be a little more varied. You might be incorporating things that you're not gonna be focused on further down the road. As you move on, the idea is to take those qualities and kind of apply them more to a strength specific lean. Remember, this pattern applies to all sports, but we're talking specifically to, to powerlifting or strength sports right now. So transmutation, um, intensification, so volume drops, the weight on the bar goes up. That doesn't necessarily mean intensity is effort, although that might be a variable as well. This means weight on the bar goes up. So over here, if you're below 80%, here you might get to 90%, and then down the road, you might actually start to broach contest numbers. Now, again, that's not set in stone, that will change, but it's, it's the pattern, that's what you need to know. It's the general trend, right? So these are the training blocks that we focus on, and then different people will have different leans. I mean, some people will focus specifically on power development and speed at one point. Um, some people will pair different qualities in a way that they think is appropriate. If on this block we're focusing on muscular growth, this one we're focusing on your nervous system. At the end of the day, it all kind of encapsulates the same type of training decision, so we're not gonna get too hung up on those details. All right, so we just gave a refresher course on the finer points of periodization and how weeks go into blocks and blocks go into contest prep. So now we're gonna to start to focus on the individual workout. So we have to, first of all, pick what our main lift's gonna be, how we're gonna structure that main lift, what the, our frequency is gonna be, and then we can start to focus on patterns. Uh, how is the volume gonna change? Is it gonna be linear or waved? What is the set and rep scheme gonna be like? So one of the first things I go into is the structure of the main lift. In most strength-oriented programs, you tend to see everything centered around a main lift with a series of accessories. And the main lift will either work up to a top set or it will be sets across. So a top set might be working up to, let's say 80% for three. So a top set is the heaviest set and you usually see it by itself. If we have multiple sets, those are sets across. So on the other hand, if I have 80% for five sets of three, that's a different type of progression. Now volume is important. Most of your growth, especially early on, is gonna be from repeated touches with the main movement or some close variation. So you might see a pattern where there's one top set in the main lift and then a bunch of volume sets in some accessory. There might be a top set in the main lift and a bunch of back off sets with the main lift. A lot of times you'll see just the sets across and those sets across will progress. And they all have slightly different implications. One isn't necessarily better or worse than the other. I usually see the top set with a linear approach where you're working up. That's the thread of progressing weight that's ultimately going to lead you to your openers or your new one rep max at the very end of the program. So structuring your workouts around a top set can have kind of a good psychological effect because you can see how cleanly you're building towards that number at the very end of the, uh, of the macro cycle. So because I'm always trying to think one step ahead, it actually helps me out quite a bit when I have that top set to look forward to, even if it's lighter early on. So one of the themes I wanna kind of drive into your head is that these training cycles, they exist on a ramp. So you're gonna see this, this trend where you're building up over time. So a lot of times early on, it can be really hard to try and think about what your effort should be like, how difficult things should be. Like I'm trying to pick sets, reps, and percentages, but if I'm at a four week block, should week one be just as hard as week four, even though the sets and reps are different? I look at the effort as a, a 
car that's on a runway that's driving into mud and you're trying to get as far as possible. So if I'm starting here and the further I get, the muddier it gets, I want as much of a runway as I can to try and pick up momentum. So that's my, that's my truck. Or is that a train? I don't know. You get the idea. The idea is to get as much momentum on the hard ground and the hard ground is where the weight's moving easy, it's moving fast, that's where you can complete every set without a doubt. And as you get further into the block, that's where you get into you know, muddy terrain. The more momentum you have from here, the farther you're gonna go there. And then we reset. Every time we reset the block, you're back on that hard pavement and you're driving forward. So if you start out in the mud, if you start out missing reps, if you start out with the effort too high, the intensity too high, you're gonna hit that mud trap earlier on. So always look at these mesocycles, look at these training blocks as opportunities to pick up momentum and get as far into the mud as you can. That's the, the way of reasoning that makes sense to me. So knowing that with our main lifts, if week one I have 80% for three, that's a pretty easy set for three. So then I might go to 85% by two and we're progressing the intensity, but it's still not too difficult. Then I might go to 90% by two. Okay, that's gonna be a little more challenging. And then maybe the last week before I deload, I'll bump up to 95%. That's just one possible pattern. There's a lot of patterns. So then another subtle point is gonna be, is this purely linear or are we gonna wave it? That's a subtle point you wanna know ahead of time before you start writing things down. A purely linear program, you can go onto any old school powerlifting page and you'll find from the 70s, they have something that starts at five by 10 and then it moves down without even taking a deload to two by three to two by two to eventually just one rep. Now that's purely linear. Now, as guys got smarter, they realized that fatigue accumulates and where you should be moving the most weight, you might still be not recovered from earlier weeks. So they started putting in deloads. So the only real difference is that progression happens the same, but every three to four weeks you have this break. So you're still climbing up in percentages, but a 10 week block might be split into three individual blocks with a deload in between. Another option is to wave it. I really like waves because it, it feeds into my ramping analogy that, that it uh, gives you the time to, gives you the ability to get momentum. So five, three, one's a good example of waving. Five, three, one, you hit your top set of five the next week, then your top set of three or more the week after, and then week three is your top set of one. Then you deload and then you reset. Again, periodization, we're periodically coming back to the same point and progressing just 10 pounds more. So on week five, you're right back where you started just with a little bit more weight on the bar. So they don't have to be that quite short or meticulous. I like aggressive waves. So maybe I'm going 70, 75, 80, and then I'll drop back 75, 80, 85, and I'll progress that way with deloads in between to give yourself a little period of recovery. This is a big one, and I think that people uh, conceptually miss out on quite a bit. Are you adding volume or, in, or decreasing volume as time goes on? Whether you add or take away sets is gonna have a big impact on how you feel later in the program. Personally, I like to volumize. I like to add volume as the weeks go on. You'll see a real common progression where we might go, let's say, five sets of 10, you might go four sets of 10, then I don't know, four sets of eight. So there's a pattern here where volume starts high and it's decreasing as time goes on. And if you take that to the ultimate conclusion with a real old school program, you'll just head straight down to a couple triples, a couple doubles, and then singles. The thing is we start high volume, which means you don't really get a chance to adapt to the higher volume. Your body adds tissue, increases work capacity as it has to adapt to higher volume and higher tonnages. That's something that you don't really get a chance to do early on. So I actually prefer to flip this on its head and I might go, let's say three sets of 10, four sets of 10, five sets of eight. And that might be one wave before I deload and drop back. That wave allows you to accumulate fatigue. So not only are you handling more working sets, even if you're making it a little bit heavier each time, 
but fatigue is gonna accumulate week to week. So you're really gonna optimize that adaptive response. It gives you time to adapt to more workloads before you deload and clear out. So that's something I've done with the main lift. That's something I've done with accessory lifts. I've had a lot of success with that. Now, as you get further down into later blocks, typically you're gonna see volume dropping, right? So if you go into an intensification phase where the percentages are really climbing up and your goal is to reduce recovery, you'll flip that on its head. But for an off-season program, that's great. For an introductory uh, volumizing block that kicks off your training, this is a really good opportunity to get yourself adapted to that volume and see some real muscle growth. I've had a ton of success with programs like that in the past. Um, and then frequency. I mean, you can go once every 14 days. Some of the best deadlifters I know will deadlift twice a month. Or if you're running some nutty Bulgarian method, you might go every day or multiple times a day. So, you know, you might uh, have a frequency of two times a day or more, depending on how your program's split. Most reasonable people are gonna do a lift one to two times a week. Uh, squatting and pressing can be done twice a week pretty regularly. Deadlifting, uh, deadlift variations, I wouldn't really recommend more than once a week. You can, there's ways to do it, but then we're gonna get into overcomplication and unnecessary backflips we have to do to make it work. So if you're on some easy progression with deads, once a week is about right. Um, if you're going really heavy, then you either got to take that out longer or you have to rotate the movements in and we'll get into that later. So these are the big training options we, we have to look at and we can manipulate that as we need for variety or for whatever reason. So here's our first example of a squat program. And this was in Sam Cox's book, uh, how he worked up to an 804 squat. I want to say at 220, 220 or 242. Uh, Anyways, it's a very simple linear program. So, so let's take a look at it. It operates off top sets. So every training week is going to have a top set that progresses. We start with 80% for three, not too bad. 85% for three, again, not too difficult. 88, a little bit heavier than you deload. Now this is purely linear because we go from 80, 85, 88, we deload. Then we start right back where we left off, 91, 95, 100, another deload. And then there's another wave that builds up to a peak. So it's like this linear program, or it's like this linear recommendation with deloads in between. Now the, the thing that you wanna pay attention to, the accessory waves. So I want you to, to look at this, starts at 65% for your back off sets. Six sets of three, same percentage on week two for eight sets, same percentage for 10 sets. So that's an example of a volume increase. So the weight's getting heavier, so the volume isn't dropping on the main lift. For the back off sets, the volume's actually increasing. So that's, that's an example of volumization. You're adapting to more volume. After the deload, it drops and it resets. So you're 70% for four sets of three, then six sets of three, then eight sets of three. So that was kind of validating for me because I've used that method in the past with a lot of success. I've used it with higher reps with a lot of success, but this is really getting up there with working sets. You're doing a lot of crisp, easy triples and you're getting acclimated to more sets, more sets, more sets as time goes on. So this is an example of giving yourself that runway to kind of run into the mud and then backing off and then doing it again with a little more weight on the bar. So that's a very productive pattern. So in Sam's program, the main lift was the meat and potatoes of the program. Now the accessories would run through a similarly waved pattern. So after your main lifts, there might be good mornings or front squats or Romanian deadlifts. And the idea would be to go from you know, three sets of six to maybe four sets to five sets. You always have one to two variables that you're changing as uh, the workouts progress. It's also implied because powerlifting and strength sports in general is focused towards more weight on the bar. It's implied that weight will increase week to week. And this goes back to that runway analogy because even if you're adding sets, the idea is that you should start week one light enough that you can add weight each week. So if you're running into a brick wall on day one, you know, week two, you're not going to be able to really progress the way you need to progress. So always dial back, save the third or fourth week of the block for the one where you're really struggling before you deload or before you reset. Now, this is a very comparable program I found in Chad Smith's raw squat manual. So we're seeing another linear program. The percentages aren't exactly the same, but they line up pretty well. Same thing, we're starting with a top set on the squat. It progresses linearly with a deload every three weeks. 80, 85, 88, deload, 91, 95, 100. It's not exactly the same, but it was similar. Now, Chad likes to go straight into accessories or variations for the volume. So instead of getting 
a bunch of work with just squatting. Now we're going to pause squats for our back offsets. Uh, now I want you to notice with the speed squats, he actually progresses on the first block the same way Sam does. Same percentage each week, going from five to six to seven sets of four. That's another volumizing technique. We're increasing volume. On the lift before that, the pause squats, he's keeping sets and reps the same, three by five, three by five, three by five. He's going 40, 42, 45%. Now, even as the blocks go on, he changes his approach. So the next wave of speed squats, we jump from 60 to 65%. He's going six by three, five by three, four by three. So that flips it on its head. As we get closer to what would be the realization phase or the peak or whatever you want to call it, we're setting, we're setting ourselves up for a big lift. We've gone from increasing volume now to decreasing volume. And that's a common pattern you're going to see. So keep in mind, there's multiple ways to do it, but there should still be respect paid to those same principles. The closer you get to those heaviest workouts, the less the volume is going to get. So earlier on, we're at 40%, 60%. Now we're 50 to 65%. We're at a lot of threes and fours instead of fours and fives. And the volume is dropping as time goes on. So that shows how these linear programs, you tend to see a lot of the same progressions. I mean, time goes on, you're going to see a lot of the same approaches. You're either going to keep the percentages the same, manipulate sets and reps, or you're going to progress the percentages forward as you either add volume or take away volume. That, that's pretty much what your options boil down to. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Don't get too hung up on it. The important thing to notice also is that there's no magical amount of volume to start off with. The effort should be reduced and it should allow, allow you to progress, but it's all relative. We're setting a baseline on week one. None of these performances are especially difficult, but it's the manipulations you see week to week that are really gonna dictate how they pan out. Now, this is one of my favorite examples. This is the accumulation block that comes after the preparatory block in Smolov, the infamous Smolov. Now, Sergei Smolov was a Russian master of sport. So if this doesn't solidify how simple these progressions can be, then I don't know what will. But this is the meat and potatoes of where you're really just breaking yourself against the volume and the frequency, and you're just holding on trying to recover. But I want you to notice the structure. We got three weeks, four days a week. So we're starting out with four by nine at 70, then five by seven at 75, seven by five at 80, 10 by three at 85. So we're right around 30 reps, 30 to 35 reps total. So notice when the reps are high, the sets are low. When the reps are low, the sets are high. And we're ranging from 70 to 85% week one. Week two, add 10 pounds to everything, or it might be 10 kilos, depending on what country you're in. Uh, week three, add 15 to week one. That is it. So this is kind of an example of undulating periodization. I don't really put that in its own category the way that some people do, because even with undulating periodization, you can't escape linearity. Linearity is the common theme of progression here. The fact that you have all other days where you're working other qualities, it's not quite as important as the fact that you are still progressing each day linearly week to week. And that is important. That is your theme of progression here. Four by nine, week two, add 10 pounds, four by nine, week three, add 15 pounds, four by nine very straightforward very simple and you're covering nine seven fives and threes and even small Ob utilizes this undulating periodization for three weeks it follows a two re uh, two week rest break and then it goes into an intensification phase where everything gets around 90 percent but this is a beautiful example of how easy these progressions need to be. They don't need to be overly complicated. So up here we have Paul Carter's strong 15 short cycle. So this is a quick five week run up into a contest where again, we have the theme of top sets, even though they're, they're easy, it just starts off the theme of progression. It gives you that ramp to run up. Now I like these, uh, this setup because it also utilizes post-activation potentiation, which top sets are going to do anyways. Meaning when you do something heavy for a set and then drop down, the working sets you do with the lighter weights are gonna be faster, crisper, more manageable than if you did them cold. It kind of primes your nervous system. So top set followed by back off sets. And it, it's like a reverse pyramid, honestly. He runs a gamut from 80% down to 60. And the last one is just a quick set to failure, which I'm a big fan of failure sets, I think doing the main lift to failure, it, it's, 
It's an easy way to keep the intensity high in your training, to keep the effort high. It gives you something to chase each time instead of just doing the bare minimum. A lot of people, they'll hit that 80% for one and they're like, why could have done more? Where's the difficulty in this workout? Well, when you throw in an AMRAP or a set to failure, that becomes a rabbit you chase to keep progressing. But you see singles, 80, 85, 88, 90, up to 93. The back off sets, we go 70, 75, 80, 85, 90. So that keeps ascending as well. And you run from three sets of eight to fives to threes to doubles. And it's, it's very comprehensive. You also see the last week, he drops out a bunch of the sets. So it goes from five working sets to three, and that kicks off the recovery that's gonna be part of a taper that goes into your competition. After that, you would probably deload and then have your contest. So that gives that nice clean arrow of recovery that allows you to get stronger as you start to handle those heavier loads. This is the Felipe Coan deadlift routine, which is a very well-known routine. And this represents each week all the way down. Again, very simple. Top set, 75 by two, 80 by two, 85, 90 by two. Then it hits a D load where you drop back down to 80. So that's a wave right here. We climb up and then we reset. And then we start to build back up again. And that resets that momentum. Again, truck in the mud. You want as much hard, clean, easy road as you can get before you hit the mud. Each time you reset, you're gonna get farther. Give yourself that momentum to really drive in, to pick up speed. Uh, the, the back off sets, we're going eight triples, down to six triples, down to five. Resetting the percentage at 70% at the end, again, building back up, and then it progresses down to its ultimate conclusion. Not overly complicated. The numbers make sense. They progress very evenly. You can look at this and you can see, okay, I understand where the progression is coming from. Uh, this is an old Soviet program. Uh, it's they called the USSR yearbook squat templates. Uh, this one's a little unique because it starts at six working sets at 80%. And that's the baseline until you get to six sets of four, six sets of five. You just add a rep each time. Once you're up at six sets of six at 80%, that's a volumization strategy. Instead of adding sets, we added reps. The volume increases over that period. So like I said before, that gives you an opportunity to adapt to the increasing work, which is gonna to correspond to better work capacity, more muscular endurance, and more muscle tissue, which you need for later down, later down the road. Then we go five by five, four by four, three by three, two by two. These are very satisfying rep ranges. So I like it for a couple of reasons. One, the pattern is very easy to follow and to see. Um, it makes sense, it's intuitive and it's not overly complicated. It's, it's, uh, it should reinforce how easy it is to put these things together in a really logical, consistent manner. So these were some examples of some of the most common templates you've seen that were either followed or written by some of the most successful lifters in the world. You tend to see, once you study enough of these routines, that they have a lot more in common, they tend to be a lot more linearly based, and they tend to be very intuitively put together. So in the future, when you are programming for yourself, or even when you're evaluating programs that you come across, hopefully it's a little bit easier for you to pick apart which elements they have in common with other routines and to kind of weigh that against what you think is gonna work out best for you. Now, like I said before, there is no secret sauce. There is no magic program that you need to follow. There's just better and worse training decisions as they pertain to you. Whatever you do, pick something, play with it, tweak it, make it work for you, okay? I'm sure there's gonna be a ton of questions regarding this topic, so go ahead and leave them in the comments. I'll try and get back to everybody. Thanks for watching, guys. Until next time, this is Bromley at Empire Barbell. I'll see you.